morning, everybody. So at Abney, we like spinach. And charter revision is just that. It is good for you, it is important, and at the same time, it may not be the first thing you reach for. Look, as you know, the charter is the framework for how we operate the city, and we have a group of deeply dedicated and inspiring public figure servants here today to discuss the proposed changes to the charter. I want to thank uh, the Citizen U Citizens Union and its executive director, Betsy Gottbaum, who will be here in a little bit, uh, for co-hosting this event with us. So we have the perfect group of people to discuss uh, charter revision with us today. Uh, the 2019 Charter Revision Commission Chair, Gail Benjamin, and her fellow commissioner, Carl Weisbrot. Gail and Carl are truly two New York institutions. I'll let, I'll let uh, our moderator give them proper introductions, but I just want to thank them on behalf of the civic community for all they've done. To Gail for helping guide our city through truly decades of transformative land use and zoning decisions. And to Carl, I want to say, who is co-chairing Abney's push to get New Yorkers fairly counted uh, in the census and the coming 2020 census. I'll say something about Carl. Like every time I see him, I marvel at his selfless commitment to the city. You cannot fake the kind of uh, uh, dedication and passion he has for the city. And so I want to thank you both. Uh, now is my honor to introduce our moderator, uh, Jennifer Austin Jones. So she's the kind of person that as a New Yorker you can take pride in. She is the CEO and executive director of the Federation for Protestant Welfare Agencies. And in that role, she is a tireless advocate for families and children, promoting social equality and helping communities in need. She is a leukemia survivor. She is an attorney. She is the mother of two. She is the author of the recently published book, Consider It Pure Joy. On 9-11, and I think many of you know this story, six months pregnant, and at the time, with her three-year-old daughter, she came out of the subway in Lower Manhattan to find that one of the towers had fallen. As the second tower fell, she walked her daughter over the Brooklyn Bridge to safety, singing Jesus Loves Me to distract her daughter from what was happening. Many of us here are old enough to remember that day, and thinking about her strength and heroism both on that day and after truly leaves me in awe. She serves on the boards of the National Action Network, the New York Blood Center, the New York Board of Corrections, and the Fund for Public Housing, to name a few. As Abney, we're very proud to have her on our census committee. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, Jennifer Austin Jones. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Good morning to everyone. I'm judging that by the fact that we are all here at 8.30 AM that we like spinach. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> So let's get right to it. Um, as stated on the Charter Revision Commission's website, charter2019.nyc, the New York City Charter, established by the state legislature in 1897, is the city's constitution, creating the framework for our government. The charter controls how the city spends our tax dollars, how decisions are made about changes to our neighborhoods, and the powers of our elected officials. 30 years ago, 30 long years ago, the Charter Vision Commission overhauled the city's government. Last year, in 2018, a newly appointed commission set out to do the same. Examine the charter and what and how city government functions pursuant to it. And then, with the input of New Yorkers, determine what and how it should be revised to better align our government with our city today and for the foreseeable future. The outcome of their work a set of proposed amendments to the charter in five ballot questions to be voted upon by New York City registered voters on our next election day, this coming November 5th, now less than six weeks away. This morning, we've gathered to learn more about the commission's proposed amendments and to hopefully have some of your questions answered as you prepare and as you prepare others to go to the polls November 5th and help decide our city's course and direction probably for the next several decades. We're honored to have as our leaders and guides of this conversation two individuals, who Stephen said, arguably, you know, two people who know the ins and outs of New York City government better than anybody, well, certainly most. Two people who served uh, for the, on the commission for the year and whose service to New York City has spanned the years. Their uh, bios, brief bios, brief, 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 brief bios, <laughs> 
are in the, the program for you. Uh, so I won't read them, but I'll quickly say that Gail Benjamin has served as the Charter Revision Commission Chair. She worked on land use matters for 36 years before retiring, was the director of the New York City Council Land Use Division for 25 years, providing advice, analysis, and expertise to the Speaker of the Council, the Chairs of the Land Use Committee and Subcommittee, and the 51 members of the Council. And uh, perhaps my favorite New Yorker, Carl Weisbart, everybody's favorite New Yorker. Yeah, favorite moderator. Sure. And friend, and I'm really honored to call him Fred. Uh, also a Charter Revision Commissioner, Carl Weisbart, currently Senior Advisor at HRNA, and recently he served as a chairman, as chairman of the New York City Planning Commission, and director of the New York City Department of Planning. Again, I, I encourage you to read their bios, and they're just snapshots. Uh, we could probably spend the hour talking about the great work that they've done for the city of New York. We don't have the time to do so. If we did, it would not be repetitive. You would not be bored, I'm sure of that. But we need to get to the, the matter at hand, so we're going to jump right to it. First, what will happen is uh, the chair, Chair Benjamin, will give us an overview of the commission and the commission's work. Following her presentation, I will ask a few questions of Chair Benjamin and Commissioner Weisbrot, and then we're going to take some time to answer some of your questions. So we're going to get right to it. Good deal? Good deal. Chair Benjamin? Hi. Thank you very much. That was a very nice introduction. Probably better than I deserve, but certainly not better than Carl deserves. Right. Give me a break. Okay. <laughs> um, we're here today to talk about the Charter Revision Commission, both its work and what will be presented to you on the ballot on November 5th, 2019. It will be presented to you as five questions. It will be on one side of the ballot, and it will be in 7.5 font. So all of you bring your glasses on election day, <laughs> because the print is going to be pretty small. Um, as most of you know, uh, last spring, the city council adopted a piece of legislation, Local Law 90, uh, at the request of the Manhattan Borough President, the Public Advocate, and the Speaker of the City Council uh, to create a new Charter Revision Commission to do a thorough top to bottom review of the <coughs> Charter for really the first time since 1989. In 1989, as you may recall, the Supreme Court determined that the voting structure of the Board of Estimate, which I in fact voted on then, <laughs> was illegal. And the challenge for the Charter Revision Commission of 89 started with the fact for how to redistribute the power and work that had been done by the Board of Estimate, which was representative of the five boroughs and the controller, the mayor, and at that time, the council president. They did a magnificent job. I think we can all agree with what they knew then and what they could foresee then in redistributing how government worked in the city. During that process, the city council, which had before that been a fairly powerless body, received the powers of land use and enhanced budget powers. And the mayor received much of the other powers that the Board of Estimate had enjoyed. Um, and we wanted to take a look at how that was working after 30 years and after changes that were not foreseen. What was not foreseen, one of the big ones was term limits and how term limits would affect the balance of power between the different elected officials who represent the city. Um, it did not foresee that the city would continue to grow and would put pressure on different parts of the city and in different ways. It did not foresee that the population would change in terms of the diversity and what that would mean for what city agencies were doing and the work that they might need to be able to do. So the city council adopted a piece of legislation, the first of its kind, that not only created a charter commission, but required representation from each one of the borough presidents, from the public advocate, from the city council, and from the mayor, so that all of the elected officials, save the DAs, would be elected and would be able to be involved in the process of forming the new city charter. 
Um, each one of those entities, the mayor appointed four people, including Carl. The city council appointed four people, including myself as the chair, the borough president, the public advocate, and the comptroller each appointed one person. We met for the first time in July of 1989. Um, we 2018. Uh, oh, <laughs> yes, it was, long, <laughs> it was a long, it was a long process of 2018. Um, we established rules for how we would do business and some overriding principles um, that we, as a as a body, we would only consider proposals that could not be done by legislation of the council or rule of the mayor, because those aren't really charter questions. That, in my opinion, is about having the political will to do it, not about whether it can be done. Um, and all the commissioners basically agreed to that being the parameter of things we would examine. Um, we put forth a schedule, we hired staff, all the normal things, and we started with hearings around the city to hear what the public thought. At the same time, we also sent letters to all of the commissioners asking for their input on what they thought worked with regards to the business that their agency was doing and what would make the business of the city more streamlined, more efficient, more fair. Um, we contacted the city council members and the other elected officials and asked them the same questions. And we did get a fairly robust response. We also asked all the commissioners. There's a reason they were appointed. We met with all of the commissioners individually to get their viewpoints on what they thought we should be looking at in the charter. Um, that process took us through the summer and the early part of the fall. Um, and resulted in over a thousand separate suggestions or proposals, some more advanced than others in their thinking. And we put all of them on our website so that the world would be able to see them uh, and comment on them. And we asked people to comment on what they thought, what they saw, how it worked. And staff went to work on reviewing them and culling them. Um, in the late fall, the commission got together to adopt a set of guidelines by which the staff should examine these proposals to, because a thousand proposals could not possibly be voted on, be reviewed adequately, and some of them really weren't either subject to the first two or just weren't workable things that the city could do. Um, we adopted a set of five criteria, the commissioners, by which the staff would examine each proposal, and if it didn't meet the five, it would be eliminated at that stage. And then we posted those lists on our website again. We had a public meeting at which we then adopted a revised set of proposals based on what had been winnowed down. And if I recall, there were 45 or so that we're still in after that review. Um, the staff then did several things. They did a revised, really deep dive set of research, including both book research, legal research, and practical research, talking to and reviewing what other municipalities, localities, and states did. Um, and they put together for us a set of expert panels um, on many of the topics that were the subject of those 44 remaining proposals. Um, we spent six days, five hours maybe, for, um, with these expert panels uh, and getting information from them about the proposals, about other ways in which cities choose to do this or states. Uh, and I found that very informative. I think Carl did also. Um, let me just see how much, okay. I'm gonna race through the next few months. I have about four minutes left. Um, after we did the expert testimony, um, we had a series of discussions and public hearings on that revised list. And then we had a series of public discussions amongst the commissioners. Um, many times that is not something that is done in public. Um, despite the, uh, there was consternation on the commission 
about how we could meet in smaller groups out of the public eye to kind of refine what we were really thinking in some more private way. And our general counsel and corporation counsel and COI were adamant that we could not. That any way we devised that meeting, if its purpose was to avoid the open meetings law, we in fact were in violation of the open meetings law, even if there wasn't a majority of us present. So we did take the extraordinary step of only meeting to discuss in public. And we had some really interesting conversations. I remember a particular one in Staten Island um, that went on for quite a while. I, I'm very proud of the fact that we managed to do that. We were all a little nervous at first about giving our opinions or concerns in public in front of the public, but it did work. Um, finally, in July, the end of June, beginning of July, um, the staff put forth the staff proposals, um, which were 21, I believe, separate questions. Um, we publicized that. We had public hearings on that. We did nothing except have public hearings at same some days. Um, and finally, in July, we adopted a final set of proposals, uh, which were 19, um, that would go forward to the ballot. After those were adopted, most by most by unanimous vote, some not. Um, we submitted them to both Corporation Council and to the Board of Elections. Um, the Board of Elections last week, as I said, voted on the format and decided that they could fit it on one page in a 7.5 font. Um, the print is what's required by you, the Board of Elections and the state, you don't get a choice about what the print will look like. Um, and we are now trying to publicize. This is a hard election year because there aren't citywide, statewide, federal elections that are going to be on this ballot. So it's up to us and hopefully all of you to try and encourage your neighbors, your friends, your family to take a look at the ballot questions and to come out and vote. Because the only thing on the ballot this year is the public advocate, Jamani Williams. Um, I think well, it's a great job, but I think that people feel like they just voted for him. Um, there will be a, the Queens DA race in Queens. And the state just voted to approve additional judgeships for each borough so that there will be a few judges on the ballot, which isn't usually a big hit with, in terms of bringing people out to vote. So I have two seconds left. I've fulfilled my. <laughs> <laughs> what did we do before these? <laughs> I love it. But again, I, I think this was a fascinating experiment. I hope that the public will endorse what we've done. I think what we've done is important. I think that what we've done will redound to the credit of each one of the citizens of the city um, and will help organize and stabilize the city going forward for the next 30 years until there's another major charter commission. That's my 10. Excellent. Well, let's, let's have a conversation. So um, don't want to spend too much time here, but you did say something that I'm now curious about. So 45, 44, 45 proposals went on down to 19. Uh, five criteria applied in making the decisions. Uh, clearly a very distinguished commission that was put to this task. And so um, not really questioning, you know, well, why is only 19 or how'd you get there? But I am curious as to whether or not the information is available uh, is it public information that others can see if they so desire, and where can they go and see what these other proposals were? Yes, they're all on our website. You can also um, read it in, I believe, 26 languages. 
Um, it's www.charter2019.nyc, and it outlines and has in detail all the things we've done, all the documents we received, um, the process and the transcripts for everything that we've done. You can also stream all of the public hearings that we had. You can watch them yourself. Um, and you can read all the documents that the commissioners received and saw. Excellent. So uh, the ballot questions that have now been presented uh, center on five topics, elections, uh, city budget, uh, land use review and procedures, related procedures. Let's see, what else? Ethics and governance and uh, the Civilian Complaint Review Board. And I imagine that everybody who is here has had an opportunity, has taken the time to uh, review the proposals. And uh, I'm sure that many of you, like me, when reading them, uh, sense that there was a theme that was kind of running through all of these questions, uh, that permeated these questions. I picked up uh, questions about uh, distribution of power, uh, controlling against corruption, uh, and fraud. Uh, and um, again, uh, concerns about, you know, balance of power, checks and balances. Can you speak to, would you speak to the drivers? Like in your, in your thinking, your, your process, your decision making, you know, did we pick up on the theme or did I? Is there more to it? I can start first and then Carl, because I don't think... Because I'm living in this world right now at the federal... <laughs> yeah. you know, we're, with 15 different commissioners coming from 15 different places, we're not always in perfect alignment. In fact, frequently, we're not in perfect alignment. Um, I certainly wanted to take a look, and yes, one of my themes was, is the balance of power right? That in 1989, when that charter revision occurred, we had a mayor who had been mayor for three terms and may well have been mayor for a lot longer. Uh, and then after Charter Vision, the unthinkable happened, and the mayor lost the primary. David Dinkins became mayor. That was not an expectation of the 1989 Charter Vision Commission. Uh, they thought that the mayor would give the city stability through this process by being Ed Koch. Um, but one of the major changes was term limits. And I believe that, having worked at the council in particular, that term limits of the council led to a body that could not easily be an effective balance against the mayor. Mm -hmm. um, and that we already have a strong mayoral system, that it's important and significant, therefore, to spread power out a little so that their other voices can be heard. And that was a theme we did here, not just in the Charter Revision Commission, but over the past number of years when people have felt that one mayor or another had too much power and was not <clears throat> adequately listening to the public or the other electeds. So that was a concern of mine. And you can see that reflected in both the question of Election, I think that was on people's minds with the election reform. I think it was on their minds with some of the reforms in governance of adding additional voices to the CCRB, of adding additional voices to the to COIB, which is the check on kind of improper abuse or improper slash abuse of government by government officials. So yes, I would say you definitely got that right from me. I think Carl may. Yeah, I, you know, I, I just like to go back to and underscore something that Gail said. And first of all, I want to. This is is a unique commission uh, in two ways. One, it is uh, the first co charter commission, I think, in history that has not been created by the mayor. That was created by the council, uh, speaker of the council. That was unprecedented. And of course, the second thing that is unprecedented is that all prior commissions, including the uh, revered 1989 uh, commission, uh, all the appointees were appointees of the mayor. And consequently, not only was the commission appointed by the mayor, but controlled by the mayor. And 
Here, the council created this commission, speaker and the council legislation created this commission, but, and this is, I think, a real tribute to the Speaker Johnson, it didn't control this commission. And no, no entity in the government, no appointer, had a controlling interest in this commission. So um, it was sort of wide open. And I do think that the fundamental question before the commission was, fundamentally, is the balance of power between the executive branch and the legislative branch correct? And you know, as someone, I, I do work uh, with cities all over the world, and re, re, I'm grateful for the fact that New York has a very strong mayor system uh, with a very strong executive. I don't think the city could function if it didn't. Um, that is not true of most other cities in the world, and they suffer, in my view, because of it. Um, when Gail speaks of the 45 uh, or so or even 1,000 proposals that came before the, this commission, a lot of them would have radically altered that balance of power. And I think the proposals that you see before you are, in some respects, uh, a, a tweaking of that balance of power, but not really a fundamental change in that balance of power. And to me, that's, that's really important, and as Gail said, I, I don't think there were some items here that not everyone agreed on, um, partly on these grounds, but I think everyone came away from it with a sense that it was a fair outcome. And I think the ones that really tweaked the balance of power a little bit were in the areas of budgeting, which mm -hmm. uh, for the first time give um, uh, other elected officials uh, 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 somewhat some protections against their budgets being slashed um, uh, in a uh, uh, political rather than financial uh, way because of hostility from uh, powers that be that can do that um, to the advice and consent now for the uh, future corporation councils because the corporation council represents not only the mayor, in fact, doesn't represent the mayor. The Corporation Council represents the city. And so it is, um, even though personally I had my own <laughs> reservations about this, um, uh, I think that um, it's not unreasonable to subject uh, the Corporation Council to the advice and consent of, of, um, of the council. Um, uh, and I think those are the areas, and, and, and in the area of budgeting, again, as, as Gail uh, indicated, uh, there was a, some concerns about vindictive activities that had happened in the past. Okay. Um, um, to be honest, in the Giuliani administration mm -hmm. 25 years ago, where uh, 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 the mayor- It's not quite that long ago, but I'll accept you. Well, <laughs> 20 years ago, uh, or anyway. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and I think a concern about, about the mayor using the budget power vindictively. Um, and this was some of the tweaks that are before the voters now are uh, 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 an effort to um, redress that possibility without fundamentally uh, damaging the power of the executive to determine the, uh, what the overall size of the budget should be, what the revenue estimates are, without um, um, changing the council's role in appropriations. So I think on, on balance, these were tweaks. But the underlying theme of many of these issues were, as you said, Jennifer, the, the you know, what is the proper balance? You know, and we also saw and it with the recommendations concerning the civilian complaint review board. We see it there. Uh, you know, that's not city council per se, except for maybe looking at some of the appointments. But the, you know, one of the things that jumped out at me was the, uh, the, uh, the proposals around uh, the decisions made by the police commissioner. And um, 
I'll just put it out here for me that drew my attention, you know, over the course of the summer, given what was happening in New York City at the time with the, uh, you know, the pending decision concerning uh, Officer Pantaleo. Were you, when making uh, recommendations and proposals concerning the CCRB, were the issues of the day like front and center? Was this, were you looking at issues in the present and issues over time? Tell us about that. We were looking at issues over time, and in fact, by the time we voted, Pantaleo had not yet. Uh, okay, if I lean down, I can do this, but <laughs> when I speak out, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, Officer Pantaleo had not yet. Um, the police, the, the decision. adjudicatory right. process had not yet finished when we voted, which was in <clears throat> July. Uh, but it was one of the issues that had the most passion and probably the most organized advocacy. Um, but the issue was not just on the CCRB. It started out as a broader issue that people felt strongly about on police accountability. How do we assure the public that the police are accountable not just to the mayor, but for their behavior when they're outside. As a child of a police officer, this is an issue close to my heart. Um, I don't believe that the majority of police officers are bad people or set out in the morning to do bad things. But bad things do sometimes happen. Um, or people believe that bad things have happened. And then w in 1990-something, the city council established the CCRB to deal with those issues along with the traditional issues, which is IAB and um, the court system. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a report earlier in the year, there were two reports over the summer about how that system was working. And in fact, um, Commissioner Dashi, the who was the head of CCR, the executive director of CCRB, came to our hearing and came to our expert panel to testify about the impediments he believed to them being able to do the job they would like to do and to assure the public that when complaints were brought, they could be fully investigated. Uh, one, of course, was the budget, that they have a, a very small budget compared to 37,000 uniformed officers. Um, so that was an issue we have addressed in the final report. They were concerned, one of the issues that concerned them, which we are addressing, is that right now, in order to get a subpoena, in order to, particularly in this day and age, to get information and video from body cameras or other cameras, uh, the commission, the CCRB has to meet, and a majority of them have to vote on that subpoena. Um, the commissioner expressed the fact that this was a deterrent to being able to get timely information because frequently by the time the commission could meet and the do board. that. The board. The board. By the time they could meet and do that, the, the video was already overwritten so that it didn't exist anymore. So we have proposed giving the commissioner the ability to, giving the board the ability to delegate to the commission, the commissioner, uh, the subpoena power. It's not widespread, but it allows them to react in a more quick manner to preserve evidence that may be useful in reviewing the complaints that somebody has issued. Um, one of the areas that was most sensitive uh, was the issue of false statements. Um, obviously, this is a big issue in any board where you're investigating something. But the, it was raised time and time again that false statements may be made that prevent the actual and fair investigation of the allegations. And that there was nothing CCRB could do other than turn their suspicions over to the police department for further review because CCRB could only review 
FATO complaints, which are accusation. It doesn't really matter. But they, that was not something they could review. So we're proposing to give them the power to investigate and recommend discipline for those times when a material misstatement mm -hmm. has been made by an officer who was the subject of the investigation. Um, so we have pared it down. There was a fear that it would bring in all sorts of people, but we've pared it down to a material statement by the officer who was under investigation. Um, and I think that that was a really big, and I think that will have implications and will have resonance, if adopted, way into the future. Because the experience that CCRB had is when they turned over these suspicions of misleading statements, to say the least, it was in less than 2% of the cases that the department ever did anything with them. So. I would just add that by far that was the most uh, heated issue that came before the commission. I guess land use, which we felt was too complicated to, and inappropriate in many ways to deal with in the charter, was another probably secondary issue. But the CCRB issues, partly because of the backdrop of uh, Pantaleo and other and Eric Garner and uh -huh. um, uh, uh, and started with, I would say, two quite extreme uh, or wide, widely different viewpoints among you know, people who were arguing that the CCRB itself should be an elected body with an elected prosecutor. And um, I think there was a broad sense on the commission that be careful what you wish for, because mm -hmm. um, We've seen what happens with elections for even for uh, civilian complaint review boards, and another extreme uh, from uh, that that nothing should change here. If in fact uh, you know the powers of the CCRB should be even further curtailed, and I, I think that was a, a, a by far the most uh, uh, heated issue we dealt with, but I do think, and I, I don't want to um, not go any further without noting that, n at least in my view, the most consequential recommendation that the Charter has come up with is rank choice voting. And that will but to ask about that because change if adopted by the voters, which personally I hope it will be. Um, so talk will about fundamentally, that. in my, in my view, change the way we go about uh, electing our, um, our local representatives. Can you, can you begin by just explaining it, like how it would play out? OK. Um, in rank choice, well, I don't think there's anyone here who's old enough to remember that the city did do rank choice voting. Years ago, when I was but a girl, um, we had something called community school boards. And we had ranked choice voting for those, as we did for the anti-poverty boards. And for those who were even older than I am, um, in the 1940s, we actually had ranked choice voting for city council. Um, but since then, we have not done it. What it is, essentially, is you go to your polling place, as you do now, and you will see names on the ballot. And you, instead of just filling in one box, I vote for this person as my only choice, winner take all, you can fill in up to five boxes for each candidate, for each office. And you fill them out in rank order. So you could say, I want Carl Weisbrod as my number one, and I want Gail Benjamin as my number two, and I want Travis as my number three, and all the way down to five. Now, you don't have to fill out five. You can just fill out one and walk away. But you have the option to fill out up to five in a rank order. And then when the ballots are all, and you leave, no matter how many you vote for. After the ballots are all collected, in this system, the fifth, the person who receives the least number of votes. First place. What? First place votes, right? 
Yeah. Yeah, the least number of first place votes is eliminated. And their votes are redistributed. Person who receives place. the least number of first place, place votes. votes. Their votes are then redistributed to their second, whoever was the second person on each one of those ballots. Now, of course, if someone gets to 50% on the first ballot, it's over. So what's the value add of this? There are a couple of value added. One is that we have seen increasingly runoff elections where people are elected by very small minorities and which get smaller as we have more runoffs. So for instance, in the runoff earlier this year for the public advocate position, 61% um, of the people who voted in the first runoff, in the first election for the public advocate, did not return for the runoff. So in the actual election, there were about 500,000 votes cast which is incredibly small to start with. Mm -hmm. And then in the runoff, there were 200 and something. So very few people are therefore electing in these situations of runoffs and specials. Very few people are electing the person who was elected. At an incredible cost to do yes. a runoff. Um, that election alone was $16 million, the runoff. Um, so this would uh, control against having to spend money on a runoff. That is correct and would also ensure that the original 500,000 or however many people chose to vote would be determining who oh, the actual winner of the election was. Um, number two, a lot of um, small party candidates, like the Green Party and you know, elsewhere in the city, the Republican Party, um, <laughs> said that in these elections, many times people might like their candidates but didn't want to, quote, throw their vote away. And that if you like the Green Party candidate, you looked at it and said, yeah, right, like they're going to get elected. This would allow you that choice to vote for the Green Party candidate as your number one. And then to, if you think they're not going to win, to vote for whoever else you want as your number two, three, and four. But would mean more people might take a chance because then they wouldn't feel like they were just throwing their vote away, even if their candidate got 40%. So that was, a, uh, that was of great importance. The part that went with it that we did not adopt, but which uh, a number of our board members really liked, was nonpartisan voting. Mm. Um, that you would not any longer run as a Democrat or a Republican. Um, but that was on the ballot before and lost. So we were not, at this point, willing to spend a lot of time and energy trying to relitigate. Very interesting. Very that. interesting. Right. So, we're, so, we're so gonna... as a consequence, of the ranked choice voting applies only in primaries and special elections, not in general elections, for that very reason. Yeah. Good deal. We're going to turn to questions. Uh, and as we gear up for questions, just very quickly, uh, Come November 5th, mm -hmm. uh, you have to vote for them all? You, you can vote. vote. There are five. All of these are the, these the 19 on. proposals are adopted, are separated into five questions. I certainly <laughs> recommend that you vote for each one of those five. But you can review the five questions. We have a lot of information on our website and the So research. if you vote for one question, so each one can stand on its own. Yes. Each ballot question can stand on its own. Yes. Okay, good deal. Good deal. Questions, yes. Okay. I, um, I just want to touch very, very briefly on the, the land use. Uh, the, the first land use uh, decision of number one, why did you decide that the community boards needed to see the uh, application before it was certified, number one. And number two, we know that there often is an extended DCP review of applications, and will this extend it even more? 
but uh, maybe my why is more. Yeah, so I, I think um, we had a lot, as I indicated, a lot of questions about the land use process and how it worked. I think the two items that we did approve were intended to bring a degree of increased transparency without uh, without undermining the certainty that EULA provides. And so the first item, which is and there are two items, one is that um, the, the charter recommendation is that the planning department would, within 30 days of, uh, or no, less than 30 days of of certifying an application would send the fundamentals of what that proposal is to the borough president and the local community board so that they would know what was coming. Um, it's not intended to start a, a pre ulip ulip uh, in any way or have a back and forth. It's only intended as a, essentially as a notice provision that this is going to be coming uh, for certification within 30 days. Frankly, in almost every situation um, that the city planning department uh, uh, is responsible for, that happens anyway as a matter of course. I think this is really intended largely so that uh, private applications are also, small private applications are uh, become, uh, uh, the community boards and borough presidents become aware of them. And then the second provision, which is also really codifies existing practice is that um, uh, if uh, an item is certified uh, at the beginning of the summer, um, community board has a, an additional uh, 30 days to review it because uh, the community boards frequently don't meet in August. And so again, the uh, planning department, I can tell you from my own experience, has uh, pretty much been pretty careful about not certifying applications in any event uh, uh, in uh, recognition of the community board schedule. So that also is sort of a codification. Good deal. Yes. Hi, I have two questions sort of about the diffusion of power that you all have been trying to work on. Can you speak up a little bit? Sure. <clears throat> so I have two questions about the diffusion of power that you all have been working on this part of the mission. First, uh, do you think um, or rather, what's the rationale behind giving the public advocate, you know, with the power to appoint certain board positions? I know that the public advocate position has been, um, you know, it, it's it's an ombudsperson's role, sort of in its most basic role. And do you, do you see sort of a conflict between steering nominees toward, you know, certain commissions and boards, um, and then also being able to sort of speak openly on what the government actually does, and two, Given that the borough president's roles and the public advocate's roles have come under question as to what purpose they serve in you know post board of estimate world, uh, is, was there any concern expressed about fixing a budget for those roles as you know share the city budget going forward? Um, I would say there was certainly concern on every side expressed about the role of elected officials other than the mayor and the city council. We mm -hmm. heard everything from the public advocate and the borough president should be eliminated to they should be strengthened and supported and they should have a bigger role, permanent role in the permanent government. Um, I think we ended up agnostic except to the extent we believe there should be a structure that represents views other than the mayor. And we believe that was the intent of the 89 Charter, and we wanted to continue that. And so we looked to ways that we could strengthen other elected officials to allow them to more independently do their job and to represent different views. And that is why we decided to add different representatives to COIB and to the CCRB, and why we decided that independent budgets would be an appropriate way that these independently elected officials were not under the thumb, so to speak, of the mayor in budgeting that could affect other decisions or affect the independence 
of the elected official in their pronouncements, their decisions, their thinking about projects or things that might come before them. I hope that answers. So we were conscious of it, and we did hear that these offices should be eliminated. We just didn't agree. I have a question for Mr. Rothbard. Could you expand upon um, your comment earlier that land use was too complicated an issue to deal with more in depth? Yeah. I, it was, it, I, I will start, and I think Gail can certainly weigh in this a lot. Um, from her experience at the city council, I, I think our, our sense, we heard a lot about land use um, from all sides. And I, we all know it's a highly, highly controversial issue um, and a hot issue in the city. I think our general sense is that it is an issue that, that we didn't hear a whole lot about that ULURP should, which is the essence of uh, what the charter recommends on land use should be changed. We did hear a lot about planning. And our, I think our sense was that this is something that can, just going back to one of the principles that Gail, as chair, established at the beginning and the entire commission uh, embraced, that this is something that is much better dealt with by um, uh, the legislature, the mayor, and the council working together to try to come up with uh, a better, a, 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 a more rational approach to planning or make changes in the way we do planning to some extent. I have my very strong views on this, and others have different views on this. But I think we generally agree that that should be addressed through legislation rather than through the charter. Got it. Right. I, I just want to, uh, just Gail alluded to this, which is made clear, which I think everyone here is aware of, that while we had, we were unconstrained in how we uh, address charter issues, um, the charter itself is constrained by state law. So uh, there are a lot of things that we would have liked to address um, but uh, couldn't address because of state law, and certain things that we address in a highly sensitive matter, manner that we all sort of think is a good idea but is constrained by state law, the rainy day fund for the budget being one of them. All right, so we've got one more question. I'm going to try to get some balance in the room. Anybody over here? Can you speak a little bit more about the budget proposal and specifically the advantage of having the revenue estimates come in earlier? I can. It's not my greatest area of expertise. Um, but one of the issues that the council and the mayor have wrestled with over the course of time is the fact that the revenue is estimate comes in so late. And since the, balance, the budget has to be balanced, you're working against a kind of, at times, invisible target. And then what happens, what has happened traditionally, is somewhere in the future, after the budget is adopted, money is modded in, which is not the best way to do the budget. Um, you have probably all, you may recall that usually sometime in June, the mayor says, oh, revenues, tax revenues are up and we see an additional billion dollars, but it's not reflected in the budget. So it was important to the council and other budgetary agencies that that process was meant to begin earlier in the real discussion. And so we just moved up the date, not how the mayor does it, but we moved up the date to coincide with the actual budgeting dates so everybody's working with the same set of facts since the council in the budgeting process cannot allocate more money than the revenue. Thank you. We are out of time. Can I, can I just oh, say sure. one final, this is my little pitch to all of you, which is, um, uh, there was some discussion as I, about ranked choice voting, and I, again, I think it's the most consequential thing on this ballot. Um, you heard from Gail some of the reasons why we think it's a good idea. Um, I also think it's a, it, it, it offers the opportunity to have a much more civilized 
discussion during elections because candidates will not only have to think about bringing their own voters out, but being a little careful about uh, antagonizing the voters that will uh, might support others. And, um, because they need their twos and they threes. They need their twos and threes. And so I think for New York, this uh, it offers an opportunity to get more indifferent candidates, more varied candidates, more demographically diverse candidates, a more civilized debate. And in cities that have, and states that have adopted this, it has worked extremely, extremely well. Voters understand it. Voters have used it. And voters are satisfied with it. We did, on the staff, I really uh, commend Gail and the staff for a really hard look at how this is working all over the country. And just about invariably, it has worked extremely, extremely well. So I, other I think it's going to seem more complicated than it is. Other jurisdictions, like other states? The state San of Maine. San Francisco, Maine. Um, the whole uh, state. On right. national elections as well as state and local elections. Excellent. OK. So we're out of time. We really thank the two of you for the work that you've done over the course of the last now year, year and a half or so, and uh, for taking time this morning to make sure that we are the most informed voters possible. Uh, I'm going to give you 20 seconds, Gail, to just give us parting words as chair. My parting words would be, even if you don't like all of the questions, please go out and vote. It matters. It matters to the future of the city, even if you just want to vote for one item. Uh, certainly, if you want to vote against one item, I'd be disappointed. But just go out and vote, please. It's important. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.